Hi, I'm Richard Byrne. Welcome to episode number 21 of the Practical EdTech Podcast. Today is November 30th, the last day of November, and it's time to share some news and notes from the week in educational technology. So this week was the 12th anniversary of Free Technology for Teachers. I started it 12 years ago, November 28th, 2007. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. Just started writing down a whole bunch of stuff about Web 2.0. is the height of the Web 2.0 boom. And I was trying to fulfill some grant requirements, actually, is why I started it. And then it uh, just kind of morphed into its own little thing. I wrote out some quick thoughts about 12 years of free technology for teachers and 12 years of blogging and 15,000 blog posts. Just some quick reflections about that. And I shared them in a blog post yesterday. And I'll share some more thoughts about that a little bit later in this episode of the podcast. It was Thanksgiving week here in the United States, so the news and, note, news and notes and updates from the world of EdTech were a little slower than usual. Uh, not that the rest of the world celebrated Thanksgiving with us necessarily, just that uh, a little slower. So uh, nonetheless, did come across some interesting things to pass along. A couple of them I wrote about on my blog, and I'm handful and a couple of them I didn't write about and just going to share now here in the podcast. So first of all, found an interesting TED Ed lesson about the history of corn. Uh, I actually found it on Thanksgiving. My daughters were taking their afternoon naps on Thanksgiving and I was just scrolling the web. Found an interesting TED Ed lesson about the history of corn. And the reason I find it interesting is not so much the history of corn, while that is kind of interesting, uh, I'm sharing the lesson. I shared the lesson because I think it can be modified to be used for lessons on a wide range of topics in agriculture, economics, nutrition, climate change. So it's a really versatile lesson going in a lot of different directions with that video. So check that out on TED Ed. It's the history of corn or how corn conquered the world, I think is the official title of the video. This week, I published a couple of videos, speaking of videos, a couple of video tutorials about two services that I mentioned in blog posts the week before, or last week. Uh, one is Transno, which is a neat little tool for turning your outlines your or your notes into mind maps with just one little click. I talked about it briefly on the podcast last week, and I hadn't had a chance to really dive into it when I talked about in the podcast, I got a chance to really dive into it. And I really like that not only does it switch your outlines and notes into a mind map, it will give you a variety of mind map styles that you can play around with. So that one outline you write or that one set of notes that you write can be switched into six or seven different styles of mind maps with different color schemes, different layouts, different orientations. Really a neat little tool. Uh, check that out, Transno, uh, transno.com. The other video I made this week or published this week is about how to make a Google Earth tour. So I have a video, let me re rephrase that. I've made videos about how to make Google Earth tours in the past. This latest one is about using the latest version of Google Earth, uh, the latest web version of Google Earth that has uh, the option to make some tours in it. It's not nearly as robust as the desktop version of Google Earth, but it's a good start. And if you're a Chromebook user, it's really your only way to make a tour on Google Earth. Uh, so Microsoft published an update to an app called Math Solver. Uh, so they have an updated Math Solver app, really neat little tool. Uh, students can get it for Android or iOS. It's a lot like some other math solver tools are out there. Um, Wolfram Alpha is one. Students can take a picture and it will uh, show them the steps of how to solve the problem, how to solve the math problem. You can find that at math.microsoft.com where you can get it for Android and iOS. It's called Microsoft Math, Solve Math in a Snap. 
find it at math.microsoft.com. A new Chrome extension that's out, it's called Burning Vocabulary. You can find it at burningvocabulary.com. What's neat about this little extension is it will let you highlight words that are new to you as you encounter them on the web, whether you're reading a news article or reading a blog post. You find a new word, you can highlight it, save it. It'll give you then it'll then give you tools to make a list of all the all the new words you've encountered and tools for practicing uh, those words and learning how to use them and what they mean. So check that out, burningvocabulary.com. And one other neat new tool I came across this week called Share Text uh, without an E. So you find it at share txt dot yz. Uh, sorry, dot xyz. So it's a weird URL. It's share text without an E. So share txt dot xyz is the domain. It's like Google Docs, but without the need for a username or a email or any kind of sign up at all. Just go and start writing a document and you can share it with anybody. Now, of course, because your students don't need to put in their names, they can you know, write anything they want. So it's while it's great because it's anonymous, it can also be great because it's it can also not be great because it's anonymous as well. But it's an interesting little tool. So try it out. See if it might be something for you for quick note taking with your students or your students here you know, doing some quick observations might be worth trying out, sharetext.xyz. Of course, the fastest way to start a new document is to go to new.docs.com, uh, which is a new Google document, or you can do start with a new Microsoft document, which is you know, pretty simple too. All right, so some, sh some reflections and thoughts from this week. Uh, usually, this is the time, the part of the podcast where I will share some thoughts and observations from my classroom, but I only had students for one day this week, and I only had one group of students, and they were all just sharing their, they were all, I shouldn't say just, they were all sharing their projects that they worked on, uh, they'd been working on, they had a due date of this Monday before, this past Monday before we went on Thanksgiving break, and so they were all sharing their progress on their Arduino projects. I was really impressed with a couple of my students who really didn't know much about Arduino at all at the start and really dug into the project. Uh, you know, a couple of kids who really hadn't been, let's say, working up to potential prior to this uh, really knocked it out of the park, and I was really, really happy about that. Um, but as I said, only had students for one day this week, so. I don't have a whole lot to talk about there. So instead, I'm going to share some reflections from what's changed in the world of EdTech in the last, well, 12 years since I started Free Technology for Teachers. Like I said, I started it without really a clue of what I was doing other than I was writing down some things I found, I found interesting and some things I was trying in my classroom. Uh, the name freetechnologyforteachers.com is a blessing and a curse. Uh, it's been a blessing because I didn't know the first thing about SEO, and it turns out that, that was a really great domain for SEO purposes, so it got me a lot of traction that way. Downside to it is that, uh, you know, I think it's contributed to people thinking that I'm running a charity and that, my, <laughs> and that I have unlimited time and resources to just give away, uh, and I don't, uh, sadly. That's where I'll put in my plug for... If you want to support free technology for teachers and Practical Ed Tech, I have a Thanksgiving Black Friday sale happening right now at practicaledtech.com. So check that out, practicaledtech.com slash Thanksgiving. Right. So enough of the shameless commerce. Back to the reflections. Yeah, uh, when I started this, it was the height of the Web 2.0 boom. Uh, everything was free or, you know, the business model was get as many users as possible, then we'll figure out how we're going to make money. Uh, turns out that wasn't the greatest approach for a lot of companies and so I tried a ton of things that were around for a year or two and then just went away or were, were around for a year and just went away uh, you know so there uh, you know so that's been a, a blessing and a curse for me at times uh, you know some other things that have changed you know when I started this Windows XP netbooks were you know a pretty popular product uh, netbooks in general are a pretty popular product when I started this 
That got replaced by iPads for a while. Everybody wanted an iPad, and iPads were going to revolutionize education. And it turns out they didn't revolutionize education, uh, but they were cool. And then along came Chromebooks. And everybody jumped on the Chromebook bandwagon for a while, and there's still a lot of Chromebooks out there. I mean, my school that I work in now uses Chromebooks. We use now in my program we actually have Windows and Macs that we can use, but uh, uh, school-wide students have Chromebooks. Right. Chromebooks aren't revolutionary either, so it comes back to the idea that the best ideas and the best changes come from teachers, not from buying products, not from products we put in the classroom. Uh, now, certainly products can help, but they're not revolutionary on their own. Some other things that have happened in the last 12 years. Uh, I was in my 20s when I started this. I'm in my 40s now. Uh, I had a, I had no dependents. Then I had a dog, then I had two dogs, and now I have two kids. Yay! Uh, and one dog. <laughs> so, you know, those things have changed, and the, and the personal side of side of things have, have happened. And the other big, uh, big change that I've, I've noticed over time is that there's a lot less of how-to that needs to be done, and a lot more of what-to. That needs to be done. Uh, used to, and I still do a lot of how-to stuff. Obviously, if you look at my YouTube channel, it's almost almost all of it starts with how to X, Y, or Z. But what I get a lot of calls for from schools now is not so much to have me come in and show people how to use things. I used to get a lot of calls for like how to use Google Documents or how to use uh, Google Slides or how to use Google Earth or how to make a video, and I still get some of those. But I don't get nearly as many as I used to. What I get now are the calls for what should we do? Or how can I get my student, my teachers to use these things that they now know how to use? That's where uh, I think the landscape of educa educational technology is today. It's more the question of what should we do, not the question of how to do it. That said, that's something I'm working on for 2020 is more webinars and also in-person trainings on the what should we do as opposed to how to do it. I still do the how to, obviously, but a lot more thinking about the what should we do or what can we do. All right, enough navel, navel gazing from me. So we'll wrap this podcast up with three questions from readers, listeners, and viewers like you. It's a short week, short week for me mostly because I didn't have uh, didn't have students except for one day this week and I think a lot of other people were on break as well so let's just jump into it with these three questions uh, first question up hi Richard I'm hoping you can help is there a way that students can use the web version of MS office without having to use a phone number whenever students try to sign up for the required OneDrive account it sends them a verification code to their phones thanks in advance ellie and this question was in reference to using uh, onedrive on a on a chromebook so I should add that little clarification there uh, so i did a little googling on this i never tried to do it without a phone number and according to microsoft's documentation you can actually sign up for onedrive without using a phone number so it is possible to do it i personally haven't tried it because I'm an adult and I've always had my phone on me uh, and my school uses G Suite for education. So I haven't actually had to test it out yet. Uh, but according to Microsoft's documentation on this, yes, you can sign up without having a phone number. Question number two came from Brian. Hey Richard, just wondering, do you have any videos on creating how to videos in the classroom or a class series you offer on that? I'm trying to create a library of how-to videos for my students to use to help them when working on projects. I want to be able to switch between my screen and my camera, which I will have mounted when I show finger configurations and other things on an instrument. Any help would be great, greatly appreciated. Also, what do you use for your videos? Do you have two webcams working when you shoot? Uh, I ask because I know you use Flipgrid and other tools that require use of your webcam. And using two cameras was the only workaround to get the program to pick up a camera as the original one was always in use by my screencasting software. 
So, Brian, I've listened to a few ways. Let me tackle Brian's questions in, uh, in the order they were sent to me. Uh, do I have videos on creating videos in the classroom? Uh, I do have some of those on my YouTube channel. Not many, but I do have some videos on that on my YouTube channel. I did offer a series on how to do this in the past. I did it with my friends Tom Ritchie and uh, <laughs> uh, Keith Hughes. Sorry, Tom Ritchie and Keith Hughes and I did that together two years ago. It's a good series, but it's gotten a little gotten a little dated, gotten a little long in the tooth, so I pulled it down. Uh, so you know, after two years, things change. So uh, I've, I've pulled that one down, but I do have plans for doing another one of those in 2020. Uh, so there's that. Now, as far as software that I use, uh, I use Screencast-O-Matic for almost everything that appears on my YouTube channel. Uh, and I've talked a lot about Screencast-O-Matic in the past. If you go to freetechforteachers.com and just search uh, Screencast-O-Matic, you'll see my rundown of why I like it so much. Uh, in short, I like it because I can do a lot of editing on the fly with it. It's not a professional grade editor by any stretch of the imagination, but it's adequate for what I need, uh, which is making videos like like these where I'm just showing my screen and showing my webcam. That said, I've also used XSplit, uh, XSplit Converter. I've used that to put in two webcams at the same time, to have two webcams going at the same time. Uh, Tom Ritchie, who has 100,000, 150,000 YouTube followers, uh, makes great history videos. He uses Camtasia, uh, or at least used Camtasia for a lot of his videos. So you can try that. Uh, but the X Split, Re X Split Recorder is a good one. Uh, if you've got two webcams, you want to direct uh, at the same time. That said, uh, the thing that I've also done is had my phone set up in a tripod and my webcam set up somewhere else at the same angle so that we can see, so I can uh, get both streams and then I edit them together in iMovie or Wii Video. Uh, usually iMovie, but you can use Wii Video for the same thing as well. A few options there. And the last question I have, question number three for this week, came from Jerry, who asked a question about videos, actually. I noticed that some of your YouTube videos have different cover images than what is displayed when the video starts. Is that a feature in YouTube, or is that something you do in iMovie or some other video editor? Thanks, Jerry. So, Jerry, that is a feature that's in YouTube if you have 100 subscribers to your channel. I think it's 100. It might be 1,000 now. I think it's 100. Uh... Either way, you have to have at least 100 subscribers to do this, uh, which will let you insert a custom cover image for your video. So something different than, something other than just a screen grab or a, or a still shot from your video, uh, you can insert your own cover image. So that's what I do. Now, I don't do it every time. Sometimes the screencast video I'm making has a nice screen grab on its own. I don't need to make a cover image. Other times I make a cover image for it. Kind of depends on my time, how much time I have, and also what the raw video looks like itself. All right. So hopefully that helps clear that up. So the, yes, it is a feature in YouTube, um, but you do have to have a hundred subscribers or at least hundred subscribers to do it. Uh, otherwise, yeah, you can do it in iMovie or Wii Video, one of those two. You just put a put a cover image right at the start. You know, let that run for three seconds or something at the start, and then boom transition into the rest of the video. So that's that. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. And those of you that celebrate Thanksgiving, th celebrate Thanksgiving this week, I hope it was fantastic for you. I had a lot of fun on my Thanksgiving. My daughters are now old enough to somewhat understand what's going on. And they are definitely old enough to enjoy time with their six cousins who are their also under age five. So that's a lot of fun for the whole family. Um, and last but not least, shameless commerce division of my life. If you like what I'm doing with free technology for teachers or practicaledtech.com and you want to support it, uh, I do have a Thanksgiving slash Black Friday sale going on on my uh, on practicaledtech.com forward slash Thanksgiving. And you can grab all eight of my on-demand webinars in one bundle for $97 as opposed to buying them all at $200. So get all eight of them for one one low price, one package. 
Uh, or if you just want to buy one of them, I do have them on sale individually as well at practicaledtech.com slash on demand PD. You can get them there and you get 20% off the individual ones. So buy the individual one first individual ones for 20 bucks as opposed to the, the uh, usual $25. All right. So that's that. Thanks everyone for joining me for today's podcast. As always, if you have any questions for me, feel free to send me an email. Richard at burn.media is my email address. And I hope you have a great start to December, which is right around the corner. Thanks. Bye-bye.